So welcome, folks. We appreciate your leadership and your punctuality. Um, at SETSI, as you know, we always begin on time and we end on time. But when we, be we begin any session, um, whether it be a capacity building session or a panel or presentation or discussion, we always want to give thanks to our ancestors. We want to give thanks to the creator. We want to give thanks to our elders and all the community stalwarts whose shoulders we stand on. So we share, build, learn, and cultivate the energy that we require. So we have a remarkable um, guest today. We have our brother Shadi Hafez who's doing some remarkable work in community. I don't want to butcher Shadi's, um, by any means, I do not want to butcher Shadi's bio. So what I am going to ask Shadi to do is introduce himself. Um, so Shadi, please feel free to introduce yourself right now for us. Sure. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, yeah, thanks, Victor, for, for having me here and uh, for, for asking me to speak uh, with everyone today. I'm, uh, Really honored and humbled that you'd uh, asked me to come and speak today uh, on the topic. So, um, yeah, uh, my name is Shadi Hafiz. Um, I'm Algonquin and Anishinaabeg uh, and Syrian. Uh, so, um, I'm a member of Kitigan Zibi and uh, We're an Algonquin community just north of, uh, located north of Ottawa, Ontario. Uh, that's where my mother's from, uh, and uh, my father's a first gen uh, immigrant from Syria, came here in the mid to late 80s. Uh, I live and work uh, on my ancestral territory here in Ottawa, Ontario, um, and I work for the National Association of Friendship Centers um, as their programs manager. Uh, National Association of Friendship Centers represents nationally uh, a little over 100 friendship centers uh, across the country. Those are urban indigenous uh, uh, civil society institutions. Um, they uh, offer a wide array of programs and services to urban indigenous people. Um, and have been around uh, since, since roughly the 50s, 1950s, where some of the first friendship centers in the country opened up as indigenous people started moving from uh, from the reserves uh, into the cities. Um, and uh, so during that kind of migration period, I don't really call it even a migration because we weren't really moving away from our lands or territories, but just moving within them. Um, yeah, so uh, I work for them. I'm also doing my PhD right now on sociology, uh, looking at the uh, impact of religion on uh, Indigenous identity and articulations of Indigenous identity. I'm also a research fellow with the Yellowhead Institute, which is an Indigenous think tank housed at Toronto Metropolitan University. Um, and I, I do a, a lot of uh, Community engagement, consultation work, research work uh, with Indigenous communities, particularly my community. Uh, I'm a research uh, researcher with our land claims department, um, so working on uh, uh, some land land issues uh, within the Ottawa Valley uh, with relation to my community, Kiligan Zibi. Uh, and I'm a uh, father of a beautiful 12 year old daughter, Aya. So, yeah, that's me. Thanks for having me, Victor. Thank you for your leadership, my friend. As, as, as you all know, I'm the executive director of SETSI or the steward. I'm also a husband, father of four. My better half and I um, have four remarkable children. So um, I, I give thanks for your leadership and vulnerability and, and your power in sharing all the different intersectionalities of your identity, my friend, and social location lived experience. In terms of NAFSI's work, what are some of the emerging remarkable opportunities that um, are are position for Indigenous communities. I know that you are one of the investment readiness partners. I'd love to hear more about that work. Oh, yeah, um, I missed the last part of your question, Victor. I muted right yeah. in the last 10 in seconds. Terms, in terms of the IRP program, I'd love to hear more about that work and how yeah. uh, NAFSI is going about um, facilitating that. Yeah, sure. So um, the uh, NAFC is one of uh, uh, five uh, IRP funding partners. So um, in the first iteration of the IRP, um, so I guess I'm not sure how familiar folks are with, with the investment readiness program, um, but uh, on our end, um, the program, we utilize the program to support, in its first iteration, we used it to support friendship centers in um, building their social enterprise ideas, uh, starting up social enterprises and then growing their social enterprises. So these would be friendship center owned, indigenous owned, uh, community social enterprises uh, where um, we wanted the revenues that were generated to go back into the community, back into providing the different programs and services or to grow the center itself. Um, but uh, going into the second iteration, 
We have now opened the door to any and all uh, urban indigenous social purpose organizations um, in Canada. And so um, we've actually, we're in our, um, we just opened the call for our second round of applications. Uh, so we're pretty excited about that. Uh, but in the last round, we committed a little over 2.5 million to uh, social purpose organizations right across the country uh, for them to uh, develop, build, and grow their, their respective social enterprises. And these uh, ranged from, uh, you know, businesses focused on, uh, uh, you know, arts and the arts, uh, catering, food, uh, cultural education, political education, um, hospitality uh, and, and different services for the community so uh, there's a um, friendship centers historically you know have been offering and doing uh, things that I think we could call um, or, or that fit within the, the term of social economy but for a long time we just never really called it that it was just we were just doing the work that we do um, and and uh, supporting each other within the community and also at the same time kind of generating some form of uh, an, an inner economy uh, supporting each other that way. Um, but now with this kind of program, I think it gives us opportunity uh, to access some some relatively unrestricted capital, non-repayable capital, which is always nice to uh, invest into the community and, and um, build and grow our ideas, but also uh, it gives us the opportunity to make uh, mistakes when, when mistakes are made and try things out. And if they don't work, try again um, without the fear of, you know, you know, a loan over your head or something like that. So um, yeah, it's been, a, it's been a really great program uh, for friendship centers and, and urban indigenous community, communities now with, uh, with us opening the door to, to all these different organizations. And so, um, yeah, we've been finding some really great organizations uh, aside from friendship centers. Um, there's uh, we've been funding, uh, and I'll give an example in Ottawa. There's a youth uh, organization, A7G, that we were able to fund their storefront um, in the Byward Market uh, in Winnipeg. There's a company, uh, an organization called Build Inc., which works with Indigenous people to get them uh, involved in the trades. And so it's a kind of a construction company, um, but they uh, build their own houses to sell it goes back into the program to teach uh, people the trades and such so um, some really great uh, organizations and projects across the country that we've funded through this so far thank you so much shadi for all those insights and for the, the your candor um definitely the investment readiness program um, which was announced in the fall economic statement of 2018 was one of three pillars the social innovation advisory council that's about to be announced the investment readiness program and the social finance fund and I'm all so our hats off to our colleagues at ESDC, Corinne Bagley, Robin Wisner, and their entire team for their work. And I think you, you mentioned something that was really um, interesting. You said um, non repayable capital. And this is a term um, yeah. that I think is so important for Black and Indigenous communities. When you think about economic reconciliation, yeah. one of my elders and colleagues mentions that a lot of the lands that we're on is the original um, scene of the crime almost, um, because many um, colonial nations were built on stolen land and free labor. Um, the, our Beyond Solidarity panel yesterday yeah. was absolutely remarkable, and that stems from a conversation that my brother Jeff Sear and I have been having for a while around a national Black Indigenous table, um, primarily because when you look at some of the commonalities between Black communities and Indigenous communities, our reverence and respect for eldership, our understanding of being stewards of the land, um, I think there's lots of opportunities for collaboration. In terms of land back movements, in terms of um, land access, what we've identified at SETSI is there's such an intersectional approach to this work, and a lot of groups are working in, in isolation. So I'll give you an example. When it comes to land access, you have the food sovereignty movements working diligently to access land. Then you have folks in the social purpose real estate space working hard, like Graham from Trinity Centers, Brother Isaac Olawafe from Dream Legacy Foundation, Cheryl Case from CP Planning, trying to develop out um, models. Then you also have the affordable housing folks and the co-op folks. So all these folks are trying to access land. And when, when I talk to my colleagues at different philanthropic foundations, in some instances, these philanthropic foundations are trying to secure land for public use for social purpose real estate, for um, agricultural development, for housing, and are out, being outbid three to one by the private sector. How is NAFSI, um, or, or yourself as an individual, um, how, how are you conceptualizing land back movements in Canada? 
a big question. Big question, Victor. Um, and uh, I, yeah, I think uh, just before getting into that, it is important definitely to contextualize what you had mentioned earlier about the non payable capital. For, for us, that's a very important aspect, uh, I think, of the IRP and any kind of um, work towards, I don't like the term economic reconciliation, but any kind of work towards economic liberation for indigenous communities is that, um, like you mentioned, uh, Victor, the, the wealth of Canada and the United States uh, is built on uh, free land and free labor, right? And then within the Canadian context, uh, the wealth that's been taken out of our lands has built um, uh, this country up to what it is today. And the, the, the standard of living that certain people experience in this country today is built off of the wealth of indigenous lands. And um, we see examples now today where, this, where Canada is trying to deny that it's accumulated any wealth from our, from our lands. And there's a, there's a treaty, um, case right now being litigated in the courts um, for the uh, Robinson and Huron treaties. And Ontario is arguing that the total accumulation of wealth that they've gained from those treaty lands since the signing of the treaty is negative 11 billion. <laughs> Which, you know, is just, it's BS. But I mean, it's, it's you know, that that's kind of what we're up against. And then the the, the fact that, under the Indian Act system, uh, Indigenous people, you know, we had no control over our finances until for some communities up until the 1970s when the Indian agent left. And my community right now is pursuing another uh, specific claim, uh, a money claim, where our Indian agent at the time uh, utilized all of our banned monies to build the neighboring municipality. So all the infrastructure, the roads, the plumbing, the sewage, the buildings, um, loans to friends to purchase their houses, et cetera, all came out of our money. And so now we're pursuing a claim to, you know, recuperate some of those funds that were stolen from our community. So we have instances like that. And then the inability to access banks for a long time, to access loans, to have any kind of agency over your own kind of financial or economic um, freedom in any way. So today, you know, um, for a lot of indigenous communities, um, we're just kind of getting out of the gate in a way in terms of like, you know, this, this, whatever this race or however it might be framed. But um, so there does need to be uh, um, a pump of, of, of capital into our communities that is not repayable and, and not just as a form of, you know, it is as a form of economic restitution, right? Uh, in a big way. And so that's a point that, that you had mentioned that. So for land back, um, yeah, I'm very um, straightforward when it comes to the land back. I, I, as a personal ideology, I think any lands that are not being utilized uh, for any kind of uh, significant purpose in this country, so specifically crown lands, should be returned to indigenous communities. So, um, and I'm talking about provincial parks, national parks, uh, different areas in the Northern Territories that are, that are considered crown lands where they're kind of only utilized for the purpose of uh, natural resource exploitation. I think those lands should be returned to the respective nations that uh, they belong to. Now in the urban context, I think it gets uh, far more complicated, especially in places where there's, um, you know, significant settlement uh, in cities, et cetera. Um, there's examples of, of um, uh, urban indigenous uh, reserves and communities across the country where urban peoples have a presence within those spaces and have access to lands. And then there's examples where, you know, we don't at all. Um, but um, I think first and foremost, you have to work with the host nation, um, wherever you are, and wherever you live. So kind of finding out who the host nation is and what the land issues they're dealing with are. And so if you're living in, you know, Toronto, Winnipeg, Ottawa, Halifax, wherever, Edmonton, um, all of those cities uh, sit on someone's territory. Um, and so finding out, you know, whose territory that is and how that land um, became the city that you, that, that, you know, you live within or the area that you live within. And then what are those communities doing with, you know, the municipality, the province and the federal government to address some of those issues and are they being addressed? Um, I think is, is, the, is the first step for everyone. So that's kind of the high level, high level work. And then on the ground, um, from the Friendship Center perspective, some of uh, 
it's 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 a bit twofold the, the answer to that question because some of our some of our the people that we that we serve uh, in our communities have been displaced from their communities, and so you know I worked at a friendship center uh, in Milwaukee, Quebec, where we uh, primarily served the population that was from about two hours away, but um, the community has no high school, um, and so. Uh, all of their youth had to come and live in our city and, and kind of like a foster care situation just so they could attend high school. And so talking about like, I don't know, 150 or so teenagers that all come into the city from the north that, that live away from their homeland. Uh, and so for us in, in that space, it was about making sure that they remain connected to their own territories. And so it was about facilitating transportation to their territories, access to their territories, advocating on behalf of them. And then at the same time, uh, allowing them to, to live free lives uh, on the land as well. And so we found, you know, a lot of times in this municipality, uh, we would have, you know, a group of um, uh, indigenous youth walking around the city and people would call the cops on them and stuff. And so for us, it was about challenging that, um, challenging um, uh, the racism and the stereotypes that people were experiencing within their own land uh, and know that people should be able to walk around their own territory um, feeling safe and uh, 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 not afraid, you know. So that's that's some of the work we do, and then also connecting people to the land. So especially within these bigger cities like Toronto and Vancouver, a lot of friendship centers right now are are, are hosting different um, uh, land based uh, healing programs, land based uh, language programs, cultural programs, where we're taking people back out to the land. Uh, to connect, uh, understand um, uh, our identities in, in, a, in a better way, uh, revitalize our cultures and connection with the land, and reestablish, uh, I think, a value system um, that was that's kind of been attempted to to be taken away from us uh, through that reconnection to the land. And when you reestablish that connection to the land for our communities, you also reestablish this um, uh, political motivation. Uh, to pursue these land back initiatives, right? We can't really conceptualize land back without being on the land and experiencing what it means to connect with the land and have the land inform your identity. And once you have that, um, uh, I think the, the political motivation then kind of starts to grow and emerge from there. I hope that answers your question. It's a big question right there, but that yeah, trying to take, answer as best as possible. No, those are remarkable insights, um, my brother. So I appreciate your leadership. And as you said, political motivation, that's another synergy um, or connection between Black and Indigenous communities in terms of politics. So this year is the last year of the UN decade for people of African descent. That was um, the UN DPAD. And Indigenous communities have a very similar declaration. Um, the, the UN, as, as you know, made a similar declaration. I'd love for you to share a bit around that um, for our colleagues and participants here today. For UNDRIP? Yes, sir. Yeah, so um, uh, within the international community uh, context, yeah, indigenous communities all over the world uh, have been working uh, pretty diligently since uh, I believe about the 1970s is when some of the um, initial work into UNDRIP started happening. And um, this is a universal declaration on the rights of indigenous people. Um, and uh, within it, there's, there's a lot in UNDRIP. Uh, but essentially, you know, calls on states to respect indigenous uh, self-determination, and uh, 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 indigenous rights to language, culture, identity, land. Um, and and there, there are some provisions in there as well about, you know, uh, economic freedom and economic self-determination as well, uh, political self-determination. So um, Canada, the United States, New Zealand, and Australia were actually the four states that pushed back against uh, UNDRIP for many, many, many years, uh, and really only signed on under the understanding that it was not a legally binding document and that each state would kind of figure out their own framework or mechanism for how they would apply it within the Canadian context. Uh, so Canada did finally sign on to UNDRIP. Um, uh, there's uh, ongoing conversations right now, and uh, um, from my understanding, the government's trying to figure out uh, how to make Canada's laws fit within the parameters of UNDRIP. Uh, I'm not quite sure how they're gonna do that because BC did uh, also pass similar legislation saying that British Columbia's laws had to line up with UNDRIP and um, 
I think the issue, the issue is who's interpreting the provisions of UNDRIP and, and under what lens are they interpreting that? So I think the way I might interpret what's in UNDRIP is gonna be very different from, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, the liberal minister of justice might interpret the provisions of, of, of UNDRIP. And so um, that's, that's something that I think is still being uh, worked out at the national level. Uh, there, there are some working groups and, and, and different consultation processes with communities, and there's differing views uh, across the board, whether under it, um, as you know, something that is not legally binding on the international level can actually implement the changes we want, and there's people that feel like it, it really can, and so uh, there's, there's, there's a pretty diverse, diversity in opinions in, in uh, Indian country right now about that, so um, yeah. Yeah, that's a little, little bit about under. No, that's remarkably helpful. And you use the key word within your um, statements, you use the word self-determination. And that's one of um, another um, intersectional or um, piece that Black and Indigenous communities share. Um, we have a word, Kujichagalia. And Kujichagalia literally means self-determination. And when I think about these terms that came from our ancestors, these blueprints, black prints, these, these, these models and frameworks, um, it, it, it's a perfect segue to my next question around eldership. Um, a lot of our conversation yesterday was around eldership and Setsi's actually been leading a series um, called When Elders Speak. In terms of your work at NAFSI and your own, um, I guess, work towards on your journey in terms of identity, social location, lived experience. Um, what is your relationship with eldership and, and how do you um, see eldership within your community manifesting? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question, Victor. Um, so I, I can I can kind of answer that on, on two different fronts. Um, but for, for NAFC, uh, we take the role of elders as well as the ancestors within our work uh, very seriously. Uh, so it's actually embedded within our governance structure. So within our, our national governance structure, we have, uh, you know, our board of directors and our executive. Uh, we also have a youth council and then we have our Senate. And our Senate is kind of where we include um, uh, all, all of the um, uh, elders from the Friendship Center movement who are represented in that center. So from each kind of region across the country, as well as uh, there's, there's some, maybe some multiple from different regions, but it's the people that have been in the movement, you know, going on, uh, you know, 50 years, 60 years, some of the early people that, that founded Friendship Centers, uh, that started the first Friendship Centers, those knowledge keepers within those communities. And so we've honored them by giving them, you know, these lifetime seats um, on, our, on our Senate. And so they, they are uh, involved in decision-making at our government level, uh, included in decision-making, uh, they have a vote. Um, they can participate in all of our annual meetings and discussions, and they guide, you know, our, our strategic planning, uh, our policies, our reactions to policies, uh, et cetera. And so we make sure to include uh, our elders and the people that have that knowledge and wisdom uh, in, in all of our governance structures and decision making processes. And so that's kind of one way that we remain accountable uh, to the elders in our community and, and, and uh, respect and adhere to their to their opinions as well. Um, and then another aspect of that within the Friendship Center movement, um, uh, I'd say it's the Friendship Center movement is really driven uh, by elders as well. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, how do I explain this? Uh, we were actually just I was just in Halifax yesterday and we were meeting with some some of our centers and this had come up is that a lot of our centers. Um, we're kind of almost in a little bit of a crisis mode now because so many of them are run by people who have been running them for about 50 years or so, right? And so people who have been at the center from the beginning to the end and they have all this knowledge and experience and people who are getting to that retirement uh, place now, a lot of our centers have directors and, and you know board presidents and people that, that really were integral to the centers that are retiring. And so we're figuring out, you know, how do we, how do we ensure that the next generation can learn from these people and, and that there's a, a, a good transition that can keep these centers alive and well and, and operating, um, but also kind of transforming into a new generation, a new era as well. Uh, and so that's something that we're trying to figure out how to, how to bring people who have been in our movement for so long um, and, and people who are just kind of getting into it uh, together uh, to, to learn from one another. So. 
No, that's remarkably helpful. When we when we think about succession planning and intergenerational collaboration within the Black community, similar challenges and similar emerging nascent opportunities. We had a remarkable panel yesterday called our Legacy Leadership Panel. And one of our um, um, stall, community stalwarts, Craig Wellington, the Executive Director of the Black Opportunities Fund, mentioned um, um, almost a metaphor talking about when um, Jamaica was running that um, 4x4 100 relay race and Asafo Powell was the last man to receive the baton and now Hussein Bolt ran behind him the entire time. And that's the way he conceptualizes eldership. We, we need our elders to continue to be behind us. And then our elder Abinah Janelle Scared also conceptualized eldership from the standpoint of ensuring that our elders not just pass the baton, but create a space where younger folks can create new realities because they're walking into a new world. Um, so when I, when I think of that, I think of the importance of the work that my elder um, Emmanuel Meles is doing at NAPSI, the Network for the Advancement of Black Communities. He actually recently developed something called an elder in residence. Um, and the first elder in residence is our elder um, Anan Loli the founder of the African Food Basket and now the chair of the Black Food Sovereignty Network. So finding ways to almost create these tenured positions within organizations, institutions for our elders, because as you said, they are the knowledge keepers, they are the knowledge stewards. So um, thank you for all those actual insights and, and the remarkable um, information that you shared with us. My next question is more around um, other forms of governance, because obviously eldership is a form of governance. Um, in terms of um, in the, the Black community, matri matriarchy and matrilineal models basically have um, been some of the best models within all our civilizations. And patriarchy has literally devastated the entire planet um, through extraction and dominant forms of colonial frameworks. Um, I bring that up to say, in terms of your work at NAFSI, I remember years ago, um, a remarkable organization, the Canadian Community Economic Development Network, SEDNET, had a conference, and I got to sit on a panel with your colleague, Jocelyn Forsma. That's actually how I originally met NAFSI. It was about five, six years ago. And I sat on the panel, and I was just inspired by the level of brilliance um, um, that, that comes um, when we actually allow um, the, 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 our communities to find, to define our own leadership frameworks and models. Um, so with that being said, what does gender justice and gender equity, matrilineal or matriarchal models look like within indigenous communities? Yeah, uh, really important question as well, Victor. Um, I think uh, within the indigenous context, there's a lot of work being uh, done to, to undo uh, the influence and um, uh, uh, the way that uh, patriarchy was inserted within our communities. And so, you know, through different uh, colonial Christianization and, and, and capitalistic processes within our communities, uh, specifically the imposition of the Indian Act, which um, uh, prohibited Indigenous women from um, holding leadership positions within our governance structures and communities. So the Indian Act election system for up until the 1950s uh, prohibited Indigenous women from participating in that process. And then the fact that the Indian Act also prohibited Indigenous women from passing on their lineage uh, through uh, gender discrimination um, in the status system. Um, and so, you know, for, for up until 1985, if you were an Indigenous woman and you married a non-Indigenous man, you would lose your Indigenous status and not be able to hand that down to your children. Uh, and when Indigenous women advocated to, to push back against that, uh, a lot of Indigenous uh, uh, men run in organizations uh, did not want that to happen and they pushed against that um, and to this day there's still a lot of uh, issues within our communities with regards to uh, the imposition of patriarchy and, and patriarchal values that are still informing a lot of our leadership and, and governance structures across the country. Um, that being said, uh, interestingly enough, the Friendship Center movement has always been a women-driven uh, movement. Um, as opposed to the indigenous political organizations, which have uh, tended to be a little more male than male. Um, and it, when you look at, uh, I actually do a presentation sometimes on the history of um, indigenous governance in the country. And I do a side-by-side -side photo of the first friendship center boards. Uh, and then um, some of the early, Indigenous political organizations like the National Indian Brotherhood and the League of Indian Nations. And the, the, the photos are, are, are a pretty good uh, um, image representation of, of, of that because what you see with the Indigenous political representation going, going back 
30, 40, 50 years is that it's all men in the photo. And then when you look at the friendship center movement uh, boards and, and groups is predominantly women. Um, and so that was uh, historically the friendship centers were a space, uh, I believe. In, and there hasn't been a whole lot of research into this quite yet. It's just kind of internal work that, we, that we've that we uncovered on our own and no one our own is that within the community friendship centers were a space where um, uh, given the fact that Indigenous women could not participate in the governance structures of our communities and the political governance structures of our communities, these became spaces where um, agency and authority and jurisdiction by Indigenous women could be kind of practiced within the urban context. And so a lot of the first friendship centers were founded by women. Uh, the boards were made up by women. And to this day, the majority of our centers are led by women executive directors and women uh, presidents as well. So um, within our movement, we value that and definitely respect that and, and uh, uh, hold that up uh, as, a, as an example of uh, an approach um, to governance that within, within our understanding of it, you know, we make sure that we include uh, elders, youth, and women within our governance structures and our leadership structures and um, other issues. Uh, within even our, our movement, for sure. And those are things that we're pushing back against. Even um, even in the, in the ways that we meet with each other. Uh, so at our annual meetings for a long time, we had uh, very rigid and colonial um, meeting processes uh, that I think you know are, 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 are a result of different uh, colonial patriarchal systems. And so we're trying to do away right now with a lot of those structures and redevelop um, uh, processes and decision-making processes and communications processes that are informed um, by our, by our indigenous, indigenous identities that are far more holistic and value um, uh, elder youth and women representation in those spaces. And so we actually just got rid of Robert's Rules of Order. Um, we're no longer using those with our meetings and uh, uh, structuring things a bit differently. But yeah, I definitely encourage people to take a look at um, the Friendship Center movement across the country and you'll find uh, actually each of our provincial territorial associations. So the national movement is uh, woman led and each of our provincial territorial associations is woman led, I believe, yes, except for Manitoba, but Saskatchewan, Alberta, British Columbia, Ontario, uh, uh, all of those regional associations are also led by women and predominantly, I believe. <laughs> I'm trying to think back on all the employees within each of the organizations, but yeah. I think it's safe to say that we're a majority woman-led organization. I am the minority at the NAFC. <laughs> so. Well, that probably speaks to the success of NAFC and the sustainability, 50 years. And, and I believe that um, when I speak to my wife, my better half, um, women are much better stewards than men in, in many ways. Primarily, they have XX chromosomes, we're XY. So um, that's probably one of the reasons for NAFC's success. That's gender equity and gender justice lens that's embedded within your framework. A lot of times when we think about the term social innovation, um, a lot of communities almost have the luxury and the privilege um, to conceptualize and talk about the theory of social innovation. Other communities, the word social innovation is about survival, literally. Um, we, we have to almost leverage the practical application of it. So when I think about um, the remarkable work that my colleague Tiffany Callender from the FACE Coalition is facilitating, um, FACE is pretty much like the first and the only Black CFI in the country um, doing some remarkable work around economic development. Um, there's, I believe, over 50 AFIs across the country. I'd love to hear more about the economic development piece that has been developed um, within Indigenous communities. Yeah, I mean, uh... There's different kind of aspects of economic development within our communities. And I think a lot of times what gets really highlighted and talked about are these very large scale initiatives specifically around resource extraction or exploitation. So whether that's in forestry, mining, um, oil, natural gas, et cetera. Uh, so, I mean, that's one aspect of it, uh, but uh, on the on the ground, there's a lot of work being done with you know the individual business owners, individual entrepreneurs, and so for a long time in my own community, I worked uh, uh, assisting and working with entrepreneurs to develop their business uh, plans and and kind of uh, um, gain access to um, gain access to funds. Oh. Um, 
the urban indigenous community in Fresh in particular, uh, our our focus right now is the how do we develop and build a, a sustainable an economically sustainable movement that can last, you know, seven generations going forward and um, different parties um, or the goodwill of um, overall uh, uh, Canadian society. So whenever they feel like they need to um, um, work with Indigenous peoples or make up for some of the issues that happen, we see a little bit of an influx in funds. And then when we get a government that feels a little more hostile to that, we see a decrease in funds. And that's not a sustainable approach. Uh, obviously, and a lot of some of our organizations have actually just vanished off the face of the earth because of certain uh, uh, um, political changes in this country. One example was NAHO, so the National Aboriginal Health uh, Organization that was just uh, in the Harper era, lost all funding and had to close its doors, and they were doing really great health work and health research. Um, so for us, it's really about, uh, one, on the ground, looking at how different centers can uh, diversify their revenue streams so that we're not relying on like 98% government funding and where we have opportunities to, to, to generate revenues within the community, but not just in, in kind of any way. Uh, so we do have a parameter kind of guidelines for um, how we look at social enterprise development, economic development within our community. And, and one, it has to address some kind of social need. So it's not just business for business sake. Um, two, it has to have a positive social impact in the community. And so uh, not getting into businesses that, that may harm our communities. And then three, it has to generate some uh, form of collective wealth within the community, and whether that's through employment or some kind of redistribution of capital back into the community. Um, that's kind of the three principles that, that we're looking to abide by. Um, in, in development of, of those businesses. And then another aspect of that also is to find ways and tools and mechanisms to um, create uh, opportunities for us to invest within our own communities. Uh, so one thing that I'm pushing for at our level is that uh, there are a lot of um, uh, people who are kind of, I think, waking up to or realizing this need for one land back and two cash back. Uh, and I've seen in certain cities and places people willing to give back their lands, um, people inheriting wealth and property from their great grandparents and uh, having being a little more progressive about what to do with it and trying to give that back to communities. And so I'm, I'm currently thinking through a process, you know, how, do, how can we um, have a product built specifically for accepting cash back and land back? And then being able to use that to reinvest into our communities and, and ensure the sustainability of our communities over the long term. Um, yeah, so and I'm not not to view it as charity. I don't like viewing it as charity. So not a charitable structure, but rather um, something different. So there are, there's some examples of this uh, in uh, Seattle. There's an organization that uh, allows for people to uh, pay rent to a land, uh, 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 an indigenous community that doesn't have a land base in Seattle. So these funds actually go back into a community trust to give them the opportunity to buy land back uh, within their territories. Um, uh, yeah, so there's some examples of, 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 of things like that happening right now. And so something that we're looking into as well. Hope that answers your question. Yeah, absolutely. It, it does more than answer my questions. It, it, it segues perfectly into the next question. When we speak about land, and you alluded to the healing of land earlier, and some of those initiatives, um, my wife actually um, taught me a lot about um, soil amendments and soil regenerative frameworks of just the soil and the land and the healing that's required. Um, I've never heard of Father Earth or Father Africa or Father, when, when we conceptualize our planet, um, as people of African descent, we use the term Asasiya, or Mother Earth, Mother Nature. Um, we see her as a mother, a feminine deity. Um, so when I say that, I'm, I'm going towards a question around agricultural development and food sovereignty. Is there any work that you're seeing right now merging within Indigenous communities, specifically around food sovereignty and agricultural development that's inspiring you? Yeah, definitely. Um, there's a there's a lot of communities that are trying to work around this within the urban space. Um, so it, interestingly, some of our, uh, our our friendship centers are positioned in uh, like a wide array of spaces, and so we have some friendship centers that that are in populations of like three thousand people or less, and we have the the bulk of our centers are in this like kind of twenty to fifty thousand 
people population centers and then we have a few that are in you know the million plus places and so each of their experiences on food sovereignty are quite different as you can imagine um and so uh within the urban space you know we have people doing you know these urban gardens and these, uh, some of them are building them on top of friendship centers and you know in the backyards of friendship centers and different programs to connect people with uh with traditional foods and diets and practices um one of the big issues I think for indigenous communities is this um, uh, our, 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 the, the diet patterns changed significantly over the last couple hundred years, obviously with the introduction of sugar, flour, um, different grains, uh, alcohol, et cetera, all these types of things that uh, dairy that really exist uh, within, within the societies here. So, Working to kind of reach the indigenous diets that are, are, are better for us as a people and connecting us with the land uh, generally, uh, but then also with some of our smaller um, centers. Uh, so the center I used to work at, yeah, we would do all types of stuff where we would take people out on the land to go harvest uh, fish, to go moose hunting, uh, trapping, uh, deer hunting, and we would bring that back. Um, into the center. And so we would sometimes be, you know, uh, uh, taking apart moose within the friendship center and they would drive some of the neighbors a bit nuts, but you know, we didn't really care what we were doing, doing our thing within our space. Um, but teaching the youth, you know, how to harvest uh, appropriately, uh, ethically and, and in line with our values as Anishinaabe people. Um, and then also how to survive off those foods and how to, how to um, and then live a healthy lifestyle in connection with those foods as well. So that work is ongoing in just about every friendship center, I'd say across the country, um, but their experiences are really different based on where they're located and where they're at. So like I said, we have some of our rural centers are, are still very connected with um, uh, those online practices and some of our more urban and, and, and large city centers are um, trying to figure out how to maintain that within you know a space that, as we know, we're surrounded by uh, uh, whether it's food deserts or an overabundance of crappy food, but um, yeah. No, that's remarkably helpful. And even that um, the way you conceptualized these new dietary patterns of um, white starch, white sugar and dairy, um, these are things that impact so many communities. I look at the remarkable work that my brother Jeff Sear from Raven Capital is doing around outcomes-based financing, specifically around health disparities um, and type 2 diabetes within Indigenous communities. So thank you for all those actual insights. Remarkable. This is actually my last question for you, um, and it's specific around um, climate action. Um, and the climate carnage that's happening across the planet and the fact that um, it's disproportionately impacting um, various communities. Um, in terms of your work at NAFSI and in terms of your journey, um, I'd, I'd love to hear if there's some specific work being done that you're aware of or that you'd like to amplify or further validate um, within Indigenous communities, specifically around climate action. And I'll do a shameless plug right now. If anyone is interested, um, um, the Athabasca University, Sednet's at Synergia Institute, Mike Lewis and his colleagues actually have a massive open online course specifically on um, um, uh, um, climate action work. Um, the study groups, but I'm saying all this to say, I mean, if you want, please check out the SETSI Instagram or website to find out more about the Synergy Institute and the massive online course. But in terms of the work that NAFSI is doing and Indigenous communities are doing, are there any promising models or communities of practice around climate actions, climate action and climate justice that you'd like to amplify in this moment? Yeah, I think one is that some of our centers in, in relation to climate, um, specifically climate change is that uh, a lot of our centers based on where they're located uh, have been dealing with some of the significant impacts uh, of these changes and so we have centers um, that were located you know uh, right in the middle of some of those really large fires that took place uh, out in British Columbia and, and, and uh, uh, around the Okanagan and so uh, as well, some of our northern centers had to deal with significant flooding. Our BC centers dealt with all those all of those floodings that took place. Uh, the center I used to work at, we used to deal with consistent flooding of the Yatna River up in northern uh, past Ottawa. And so, uh, one of the issues is that uh, you know, with climate change, there's you know all of these types of different 
uh, changes that are occurring, disasters that are occurring, as, uh, as movements of people, et cetera. Uh, and so our centers are one on the front line trying to support those communities within these emergencies that are taking place, but then two, their infrastructure is being significantly affected. And so right now we're really looking at, especially in some of these places where um, there's higher risk, uh, like in the Okanagan and some of these uh, 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 flood plains in different places where these centers are located, um, looking at, you know, how can the infrastructure adapt to that reality and how do the services also adapt to the reality that there's going to be these consistent disruptions within our community? And then how do we utilize uh, the knowledges within our community to address some of those issues and changes? And so um, within some spaces, uh, generally, you know, uh, out in BC as well, there's communities that are working on doing their own, um, their own, um, I'm trying to remember the name of it right now, uh, where they preemptively burn the land, you know, to prevent forest fires, and that comes from Indigenous knowledges, and so different communities working towards that, or working with uh, my friendship center that was located in Manawaki, working with some of our elders who uh, were knowledgeable about where the the river would flood historically always um, and, and sharing that knowledge with uh, again sharing it again because a lot of these settler communities were informed prior to building their cities that they weren't building them in good locations but chose to ignore that um, but you know sharing that knowledge uh, that, that we have that's been passed down from our ancestors about um, how the land changes in different seasons um, but also readjusting ourselves as well because we're seeing changes now that that aren't really accounted for within some of our narratives and some of our traditions and because of these changes that are taking place. Uh, and so making sure that our communities are heard and that our realities are addressed. And so I think for us, it's really, um, right now, I think we're, we're, we're just starting to figure out how to adapt and, and, and change with these changes that are coming down the line from us. But at the same time, uh, asserting that you know our knowledges and our perspectives and our sciences and our worldviews um, are key to solving some of these issues or thinking around some of these issues. Uh, and so we need to make sure that Indigenous communities are included in those processes. Um, uh, otherwise, I don't think we have much of a hope. Yeah. I agree completely. And thank you so much for all those actionable insights around ad adaptation and mitigation. Um, so so to close off, um, I'd just love for you to share a call to action um, to Indigenous and Black leaders across Canada in terms of how we can find ways to be better champions and stewards and operate in a place of solidarity together. What's your call to action, my friend? Just to collaborate more, I think the Indigenous community and the Black community can benefit significantly from more collaboration, more communication, and more work together. Um, and, and, and yeah, just sharing more with each other, doing more things like this. I don't think we, I think there, there, there is some collaboration that takes place, but, but not enough. And, uh, I think, we, I think we need to continue that work and, um, uh, yeah. And having those conversations and sometimes it's having hard conversations as well and addressing some of the historical issues that have taken place between communities as well and, uh, uh having those conversations. Um, so I think that would just be my call to action is more collaboration. Um, yeah, and so, I, you know, we're, we're open to working uh, with organizations within community. We can connect people with organizations in community. And so if you work in a specific place and you're interested in working with a, a local friendship center, um, I can, uh, we can share my email after, but feel free to email me and we can try and connect people if you're interested in, in connecting on that level. Um, yeah, so uh, I think that's that's it, really. I don't know if, if there's anything else you wanted to share. If there's some questions in the chat, I don't know if we want to address those at all, but. Yeah, so um, definitely please, if you can, put your email in the chat so that we can follow up sure. with anyone in the chat. <laughs> um, and as as always, um, at all things at Setsi, we like to begin on time and start on time. Shadi's going to share his email in the chat. Um, if there's anyone that would like to further ask any questions or connect, um, it's easy to reach us, info at setsi.ca. Shadi has put his email in the chat. And once again, I'm my brother, I, I'd like to thank you for your leadership, your diligence, um, your resilience, your tenacity, your candor and transparency um, over the course of this hour. And at Setsi, we begin all things as we start by giving thanks to the creator, 
giving thanks to our ancestors, giving thanks to our elders, and all the community stalwarts whose shoulders we stand on as we share, learn, and grow together for our collective liberation and sovereignty. Thank you, my brother. I appreciate you.